Let's make welcome to his feet the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is with a sense of honor and humility that I rise today to make my third contribution to this budget debate in my current capacity as leader of the opposition. Returning to this house each year for the past three years as leader of the opposition solidifies my commitment to the people of Jamaica. I give thanks to Almighty God for all his blessings and for the strength, wisdom and courage to continue to serve the people of Jamaica on the journey of national development. I invoke words from Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength. As I commit to stand up for and stand with the Jamaican people. Every year, Madam Speaker, this occasion reminds me that this journey of representation is not one that is taken alone. My wife, my forever shining star. Sandra stands by my side and in my support, and I hail her today. Yeah. Our three children and the new delight of our lives, our first grandchild, stand as a reminder of the sense of family that is so important to national development. Yeah. This occasion also reaffirms we don't want Project SPA. Before it even starts. Mr. Speaker, I move to health and wellness. There are several green papers, audits, and reviews within the Ministry of Health and Wellness that clearly outline the dilapidated state of the public health system. Even without resorting to these sources, there is a travel advisory issued by the U.S. State Department advising of the poor state of our hospitals and the prohibitive costs associated with accessing private health care. And this is borne out by the constant cries of the users of the public health system and the frustration of the health care providers themselves, often manifested in industrial unrest and protests. And even now there are murmurings of unrest in some sectors of the health service. One there for us to wonder what guides the priorities for expenditure in the annual budget for the Ministry of Health and Wellness. With a capital budget of $11 billion, nearly twice that of education, one would expect clear efforts to decrease inefficiencies, to improve the overall experience of accessing the public health system, and to address the major health threats affecting Jamaicans. However, these major threats of chronic non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and cancer, have been, to an extent, sidelined in favor of massive spend on infrastructure concentrated in three hospitals. Yeah. The massive cost overrun huh. in the Cornwall Regional Hospital yes, will go down as the greatest Great. project cost variation in the history of Jamaica at a staggering 1,100%. Never before has any Jamaican alive or dead seen a project move from an estimated cost to completion of less than $2 billion and end up costing more than 10 times that amount at over $20 billion. And this figure is expected to rise further as the completion date is pushed farther away. And the only person who predicted it accurately was Murray's guy, the member for Central St. Mary. It is telling that no one has been held accountable for this debacle. The Minister of Health has been bemoaning the lack of local expertise in hospital construction, but he's nevertheless decided to begin the construction of two new facilities at UHWI and Spanish Town. We wonder what the logic is behind that when the English-speaking Caribbean's largest community of Portmore still doesn't have a public hospital. 
And when the, rest, the Western region is still struggling without a fully operational Cornwall Regional Hospital, and when the major parishes are without a facility that has basic diagnostic equipment, and in major urban areas there's an economically unsound reliance on using private facilities for public patients, transported in scarcely available am ambulances, with this budget, users of the public health system will continue to suffer from prolonged waiting times, overcrowded emergency rooms, inadequate hospital beds, and overworked and demotivated staff who can't wait for the next recruiter for a way out. Like the census, immunization rates are well below target, and the maternal mortality rate is at its highest level in over 50 years. The maternal mortality rate in Jamaica is at the highest, its highest levels in over 50 years. There no budgetary changes to, support, to deal with these problems. Mr. Speaker, something is wrong here. I move to housing, land, and sustainable living. Land and shelter remain important national priorities. On the minds of hard-working Jamaicans is a question. Will they ever be able to enjoy the security of being able to own a piece of land or a house? Using data from the 2022 Voluntary National Review Report of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, we know that in 2019, over 100,000 fewer Jamaicans rented or lived in their own home than in 2007. 100,000 fewer Jamaicans. 30% of households were either living rent-free with the owner's consent, what Jamaicans would call catching, or they were occupying premises without the legal owner's consent. That represented an increase of 10 percentage points over the preceding decade. If you live in a major urban center, you are most concerned about the fact that the price of, a, of housing built under this JLP government is out of reach for most people. Shelter is one of the basic needs of our people. In the Jamaican historical and socio-economic context, it requires a proactive policy by the state to provide affordable housing for our people. The People's National Party understands this. It is what motivated us to develop Portmore, yeah. the largest residential community yeah. in English-speaking Caribbean, and so many other major schemes, Harbourview, Mona Heights, Frontier Heights, and a plethora of other housing developments across the island. It is why, in 1976, the most honorable Michael Manley established a National Housing Trust to provide a housing affordable housing for Jamaica. It is why the most honorable P.J. Patterson in the 1990s established a program called Operation Pride to provide land and housing for citizens, which despite its challenges, delivered over 50,000 titled lots for people in Pines of Karachi, Mount Edgecombe, Melrose Mule, Bedwood Gardens, Bel Air, and a host of other communities. And similarly, the most honorable Portia Simpson Miller embarked on an initiative to remove barracks housing and provide houses for sugar workers to live in dignity. In stark contrast, this government has built a mere 200 social houses, one one dege dege since 2016, a paltry average of 25 housing units per year. And it presided over the demolition of poor people's houses in Clifton in St. Catherine and sought to evict 65 settled families from their homes in the widest Vale. In truth and in fact, the cost of housing is out of reach to ordinary Jamaicans, with a two-bedroom unit on the market costing over $20 million, while the NHT only provides up to $9 million to a contributor to purchase a home. The NHT has been financially weakened by the government's continued extraction of $11.4 billion every year to finance the budget of the government since 2016. After the 2013 to 2016 IMF program ended, we had put that in place for four years yeah. when we had a mountain of debt to get Jamaica out of and we had a very high primary surplus target. It was never supposed to be extended. The, the, the recent decision to require NHT contributors earning over $31,000 a week to borrow from private financial institutions flows from that extraction of resources for so many years now since this government came to power. 
And whereas contributors to NHT uh, have been charged interest rates of 5% by the NHT, private financial institutions are, are charging around 9% now. And the NHT is having to subsidize those private financial institutions for the difference in those rates. Yeah. And that's going to further weaken the institution. Jamaica needs change. Yeah. We are on the road to change. We recognize that the police, the soldiers, the teachers, the nurses, yeah. civil servants, young yeah. professionals need access to affordable housing. Yeah. So that must be the road to change. And some of our proposals include, we will repurpose the NHT to ensure that it focuses on the building of affordable housing. We will end the extraction of $11.4 billion a year from the NHT for the government's budget and put this money into building affordable houses for our people. We will provide targeted and well-designed incentives for developers to get into the construction of affordable housing right. so that more of our population can afford to acquire a home using their NHT benefits. Right. And we will complete the unfinished Operation Pride schemes so that the residents enjoy the full benefits of what was started for them. And we will launch a new program based on a similar concept but with a robust and transparent accountability structure to tackle the deep problem of informal settlements across Jamaica and bring dignified housing in organized communities to our citizens. Mr. Speaker, I move to the issue of good governance because it is a second pillar of the road to change, good governance. When it comes to governance, one thing is certain, things cannot be allowed to remain the way they are now. That is why I have identified an entire cluster of portfolios within our own governance structure to address the now desperate area of transparency and accountable governance. And this is where change, the change is truly required. I move to the focus on social justice first. A robust social justice agenda is necessary for achieving high levels of inclusive, sustainable economic growth. If Jamaica is to become a socially cohesive society that moves away from negative behaviors and attitudes that undermine our mission, to achieve national greatness. Deepening social justice is an important part of this objective, and I'm going to give you some of our proposals. We will implement a progressive beach access policy to ensure that the public has reasonable access to Jamaica's beaches, as is done in other Caribbean islands that also enjoy a strong tourism industry. Beach access is important for our people's recreation and leisure in a stressful world. This is no small thing, given the levels of violence and stress in this society. We will work with all stakeholders, including communities which have historically used beaches for recreation and fishing, and also tourism interests, to secure appropriate rights of access for the public to be able to enjoy our beaches. And if necessary, we will lose legislation to protect the public's interest in having reasonable beach access while protecting the legitimate commercial interests of business owners. This is not an issue which the state can just stand back and leave as is. Time come. While we endorse the raising of the threshold for the income tax on pensions, the truth is that our pensioners are really struggling and much more is needed to be done for them. Yes, yes. Administrative changes to facilitate the speedy commencement of pension payments right. to retired em employees is impatient of the day. They have to wait for extended periods before they can start getting their pension. And we have other creative proposals for expanding pension benefits to relieve the suffering of our pensioners, which I will share on another occasion. We will complete the outstanding review of the Domestic Violence Act and move quickly to implement the recommendations arising from that review. And our intention is to establish support centres in every parish to provide safe havens for survivors of domestic violence and other gender-based gender violence. We will enact legislation to empower the public defender to bring legal proceedings, which he can't currently do, 
to defend the rights of vulnerable Jamaicans and expand the scope of the Office of the Public Defender to become a national human rights institution to monitor and report on Jamaica's performance in respecting the rights of our citizens. That institution, I had done all the preparatory work for that as Minister of Justice. Eight years later, nothing has happened. We will complete the long outstanding process of enacting legislation to enable Jamaica to accede to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which is a missing element in the current accountability framework. I had started that process as well. I don't hear nothing about it. We need to have accountability for the most dire forms of crime that leaders can come in. We will expand the legal aid system in partnership with the legal profession to include constitutional civil matters so people can get help to access their rights in important areas of their lives, including property matters, estate matters, personal injury cases, and employment matters. We will support the MSMEs, micro, small, medium-sized enterprises, and startups so that formalizing their businesses is attractive, welcoming, and easy. We have a model for special economic zones of incentives. What about the SME sector? Why shouldn't they get a similar ecosystem of benefits to encourage people to formalize and, and start businesses? We will do that. We will not legislation to require the banks to provide a minimum suite of basic financial services to customers without charging fees. And that their cost of doing that will be treated as part of the annual cost of having the privilege of operating a bank and their licensing. And we will enforce minimum service standards to ensure that customers have ready access to ATMs to withdraw and deposit money, especially in underserved areas where banks have been closing branches. Time come to protect our people who are not being served adequately by that banking sector. And we will use the legislation governing Ganja to create a special ecosystem for the Rastafari community. Yes, really and we want to economically empower the Rastafari community. And that is a matter close to my heart as the architect yes. of the PNP's 2015 decriminalization of Ganja. There are provisions in the law for regulations to be made to achieve that and they're not being used. Making change through social justice leads to a serious reconsideration of Jamaica's current place and standing in the world. Mr. Speaker, our international policy position centers on the principle of being good neighbors to all while maintaining our sovereignty and independence. That guides our relationship with the global family of nations. We steadfastly maintain the right to exercise independent judgment and make independent decisions based on the principles that we embrace. We will continue to work towards strengthening our relationships with the global south even as we maintain long-standing relationships with our traditional partners. Right. Our trade with the African continent and its large and rapidly expanding economies remains very modest. Yes. The top five economies in terms of growth are South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Algeria, and Ethiopia. Africa. And we have long historical con connections with the fast-growing economies of Ghana and Sierra Leone. There are therefore tremendous opportunities for us to build out new trade and investment linkages with Africa. Yeah. Jamaica needs to stop dithering and ratify the historic 1.5 billion US dollar agreement between CARICOM and the African Exim Bank. And we are committed regionalists. So the dire situation in our close neighbor Haiti is of great concern to us. We commit ourselves fully. Mr. Speaker, change at the national level must focus on good governance. In this modern era of pervasive information sharing and communications, good governance is increasingly essential to maintain the people's trust and confidence in our democracy. Citizens are demanding that their leaders uphold the highest standards of accountability, transparency, and trustworthiness. All the measures that I have outlined for implementation will only be possible if we change the approach to governance that now exists. I will leave you with the ways, means, quality and spirit of the change in governance that we commit to. And good governance isn't just a 
set of ideals. It is the foundation upon which an equitable and just society can be built. Yes. The People's National Party has always been committed to fulfilling these ideals and we will translate these principles into tangible actions that uplift and empower every member of our society. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are in an increasingly low trust environment. Since the JLP government came to office in 2016, no less than eight ministers have been forced to resign or have been otherwise sanctioned for a range of serious breaches and Jamaica continues to rank poorly on international corruption indices. The move in 2020 to take away the chairmanship of most parliamentary committees from the opposition has weakened that mechanism of holding government to account. The maneuvers to delay the tabling of reports from the Auditor General and the Integrity Commission remains a contentious matter, especially since the legal opinion on which this delay is purportedly based has been withheld from parliamentarians and the wider public. When the former speaker was forced to resign as, re as a result of an integrity commission investigation, the, the move to replace her with the wife of the prime minister, so that the head of parliament is now the spouse of the head of government, really does not sit well with the tradition that the speaker must act independently of the government of the day. The speaker, the speaker is intended to be independent and must act independently of the government of the day. That is the tradition. That is the, that is the tradition. The failure. without a quorum 
I think it's the first time this is ever happened in independent Jamaica. That's in a budget speech. The opposition has been denied the opportunity to finish their presentation. And here I am assembled on Duke Street. I was near the end anyway, but there were some important points that needed to be made. And I'm going to continue. The point I made when they walked out was this. When the former speaker was forced to resign as a result of an integrity commission investigation, the move to replace her with the wife of the prime minister so that the head of parliament is now the spouse of the head of government does not sit well with the tradition that the speaker must act independently of the government of the day. That is a fundamental principle of the Westminster system of democracy. And it is protected in a number of ways. For example, in the United Kingdom, Nobody runs against a speaker in an election. They make sure the speaker is elected because that person is supposed to be independent. So that, I think, that move to do what ha happened in our case here was inconsistent with that level of independence that's required. The failure to disclose the identity of the so-called illicit six MPs who are under investigation by the Integrity Commission for illicit enrichment remains a festering sore. Only made way made worse by the Prime Minister's gag order and his own cabinet ministers from speaking publicly on matters to do with the Integrity Commission. The Prime Minister's statutory declarations of assets and liabilities and income have not been certified and published by the Integrity Commission for successive years. It is untenable for the head of government of Jamaica not to be in good standing with the country's Integrity Commission for a prolonged period. All I can say to him, and I would have said it to him if we were still in the house, all I can say, if I were in your position, I would take for myself and hand over to someone else who is not compromised. How to open your car door while submerged underwater. Jamaica's iconic global track superstar, the Honorable Usain Bolt and many other in innocent investors were carried down in the scandalous SSL fiasco. And we can't hear anything about charges being brought against the culprits. I have been told that the DPP's office is pulling, is dragging their feet when there are a number of people that the Financial Investigations Division are seeking to bring charges against. In fact, in August last year, the cleaner carried a report that but from the FID that there were several persons that they were intending to move against with charges. That report is no longer on the Glena website, but I am told that the DPP's office is dragging their feet on this. The Kroll forensic report, which has cost taxpayers millions of dollars, was delivered to the government months ago. It must be released to the public so we can see what the findings are. Jamaica will not accept a cover-up of this shameful debacle which has tainted our country's reputation as a safe and well-regulated place for Jamaicans at home and abroad to save and invest. In fact, a commission of inquiry into this SSL scandal will be needed. Jamaica is crying out for change in this area. This is why I have identified an entire cluster of portfolios within our own governance structure to address the now desperate area of transparent and accountable governance. We must translate good governance principles into tangible action that restores trust and confidence in our leaders and preserves our cherished freedoms and democratic way of life. Change needs no more hiding of the truth from Jamaicans. Change, change means no more deception in official public communication. Yeah, yeah. Change means putting transparency and communication at the heart of good governance. Yeah. Yeah. It affirms that respect is due to those who elect governments and pay taxes. That's why we will implement a comprehensive strategy centered around engagement and accessibility. Our aim is to ensure that every voice is heard, yeah. to bridge the gap between leadership and the people. This means holding town hall meetings, physical and virtual, to give every citizen a voice in the decision-making process. It means conducting community walks, listening to the concerns of our constituents, and working together to find solutions. It means providing regular progress reports on projects and programs, and keeping the public informed and involved every step of the way. 
change means practicing accountability as a central principle of good governance. That's why after the terrible incident of the woman being beaten in public with a stool, I tabled an impeachment bill in the House of Representatives in 2021 to provide a mechanism to hold to account any parliamentarian whose egregious conduct brings his or her office into disrepute. Despite this having been a manifesto promise of this JLP government from the 2016 general elections, my impeachment bill has not been allowed to go forward to a joint select committee for wide stakeholder consultation and then be passed into law. They don't believe in accountability. When I entered the political arena, there were some entrenched ways of doing things. Making change happen requires a fresh approach. Things will be very different under my watch because I will tolerate none of it. The last PNP administration put local government in the constitution. We passed the three strategic laws to modernize the legal framework of local government in keeping with modern best practices. One of those laws, the Local Governance Act, makes provision in section 18 for the recall of an elected mayor. And it may be initiated by a petition alleging a charge of gross misconduct or dereliction of duty and it has to be signed by at least 25% of the registered voters in the city municipality. The next PNP government will institute a fair and balanced recall system for elected officials, both at the local government and parliamentary level, to deepen accountability and empower the voters with recourse where they are badly let down by whoever they elect to parliament. Change, change means not taking away the rights of the people of Portmore without proper consultations with them, followed by a referendum to let them make the decision whether or not they want to give up their city municipality status and their right to directly elect their mayor, a right given to them by the People's National Party. Yeah. Jamaica has spoken and the PNP has listened to the concerns of the people. We are offering solutions based on thorough research and consultation with the st our stakeholders. We will embark on this journey together with the people towards a future where opportunity for advancement is not a privilege but a right for yeah. all. We commit to good governance for the people of Jamaica, yeah. not as some abstract concept, but as a living promise fulfilled to every citizen of our nation. We are on a fast track on the road to change, and we invite all Jamaicans along this exciting journey in a spirit of hope for a better and brighter future yeah. for all our people. And I would have ended, thank you, Madam Speaker, but I won't in that way because I'm not in the Parliament. I'm on you.